In the next part of the course, we're going to focus on representations of Lie groups. So remember that a representation of a group is a homomorphism R from a group G to a group of matrices. So in other words, it's a map from G to GLN C. So you can take representations over other fields than C, but in this course, we're pretty much exclusively focusing on complex representations. In other words, a representation is a way of assigning a matrix R of G to each group element, G, in such a way that if you were to multiply the group elements, so G1, G2, and take the corresponding matrix, that would be the same as multiplying the matrices corresponding to G1 and G2 individually. And the identity element goes to the identity matrix. So you should really think like the image of this representation is a group of matrices that in some way looks like G. It could be a lot smaller than G, it could be a quotient of G, but it behaves in some sense a bit like G. So in this course we're going to look at smooth representations because we're doing Lie theory. In other words, we want to be able to differentiate the matrix entries of RG with respect to the local coordinates on G. And so G is going to have to be a Lie group or in this course, a matrix group. So why are we doing this? So why are we doing all this stuff about representations? Well, it turns out that it's all about the applications. So representation theory really has a lot of cool applications. So first of all, there are internal applications to the theory itself. You can, by looking at the um, adjoint representation of a group, which we'll talk about later, you can basically classify a large bunch of groups called the uh, semi-simple Lie groups. And this is one of the early triumphs of the theory. It's really nice, uh, really nice theorem. It will hopefully come across later. Um, also internal within mathematics, um, invariant theory, which is a 19th century, originally 19th century idea for basically generalizing determinants. Um, there are lots of applications to this representation theory, uh, of this representation theory to invariant theory. Again, we'll come across some of these later. But more excitingly, to my mind, there are external applications. So um, applications to particle physics. Um, so my favorite of these comes from the 1960s. So people were discovering new particles by the boatload and they didn't know where they all came from. Um, and they wanted some sort of organizational principle for saying, you know, maybe all these particles are made up of smaller particles in some way. So this was the hadrons and the mesons and uh, sort of pions, and I don't know, all these sorts of things. And so by looking at the tables of particles and comparing them with diagrams, weight diagrams of irreducible representations of the group SU3, um, it turned out they were able to guess what the internal structure should be so that uh, the baryons should be made up of uh, three quarks glued together in some way and that the mesons should be made up of two quarks glued together in some way. And this, this whole idea came about by looking at um, representations of SU3. And it actually led them to predict the existence of a new particle, which was subsequently discovered. So I think this is my favorite application of, of Lie theory to physics. And we'll talk about this once we've done the representations of SU3. So just I just want to recap um, basically the punchline of the first half of the course, uh, which will be one of the main tools we use to study representations of Lie groups. Namely that given a representation from G to GLNC, we get a Lie algebra representation
R star from little g to little g l n c. What do I mean by the algebra representation? I mean a linear map which preserves the Lie bracket. So R star of x bracket y equals R star of x bracket with R star of y. I have to be slightly careful what I mean about linear here because you know GLNC is a vector space over the complex numbers. It's also a vector space over the real numbers, right? I can rescale a complex matrix by a real number too. And little g a priori is just a vector space over the real numbers. So I really have to be talking about real linear maps here. In other words, r star of lambda x equals lambda r star of x, where lambda is real. At some point, we will complexify the Lie algebra and turn it into a complex vector space and then look at complex linear maps, but for now, just real linear maps. So uh, the, the key thing connecting these two things is this equation that r of x x equals x of r star x for all x in the Lie algebra. And this tells us that R determines R star basically by differentiation. If I stick a parameter T inside next to X and differentiate with respect to T, I'm going to bring down a factor of R star X. So that's basically how I figure out what the Lie algebra representation is. So this is by differentiation. We'll see lots of examples of this. We've, had, we've already seen one example, but we'll see many more. And actually, R star determines R in, under certain conditions. It kind of looks like it determines R, right? Because it's telling you R of X X is determined by R star. So certainly R star determines R for all G um, in the image of the exponential map, so in X of little g. I should say r star determines r of g for all g in the image of the expansion map just by this formula so then the question is well does that determine r of g for all g and g well the answer is sometimes yes um, so if g is a path connected group in other words, any two group elements are connected by a, a smooth path of matrices in the group. Uh, then, yes, R is determined by R star. Basically because in this case, G is generated as a group by the image of the exponential map. In other words, maybe it's not true that every element of the group is x of something, but if you want to get to some group element, you can take x of a bunch of things and multiply them together, and then you can get your element. So this is this is an exercise. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, not a quick exercise. It's an exercise on one of the problem sheets. So for at least for connected groups, uh, knowing the Lie algebra homomorphism is enough to determine the group homomorphism. So we'll mostly focus on path connected groups. Um, then there's the question of, you know, given R star, Lie algebra homomorphism, if we just try and use this formula, R of X, x equals x of r star x does this give a well-defined map r because basically it could be that two different x's give you the same x x but give you different x of r star x's that's the problem um, and we saw that you know lee's theorem 
told us that uh, yes this is true if um, G is simply connected so again topological assumption on the group tells us that this formula always works and defines as a homomorphism and if uh, if it's not simply connected, then we have to think a bit. So we've already done the thinking for the group U1, um, and uh, that's the group we're going to start by focusing on. And actually all the other groups we consider are going to be simply connected groups, SUN, um, sort of where we consider them explicitly. Okay, so the plan for the course will be, first of all, study the representations of U1 using what we've already done, then study the representations of SU2, then study the representations of SU3, and then maybe give you some of the general picture. Because once you understand these three examples, I think the general theory is uh, a natural generalization of that.